Well, hello everyone. It's so good to see you. My name is uh, Jason, and I'm one of the pastors here at Hope Church. And I'm so thankful that you've chosen to worship with us uh, this morning. As we, uh, we're, we're going through a series called Resolve, How to Live Today in Light of Tomorrow, while we study the, the, uh, the, the, the books of First and Second Thessalonians. We believe that these letters that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica are highly applicable because they're, they are written to a people who feel that, uh, that the wheels have fallen off. You, you, may, not, uh, you may not directly relate to, to what they're going through, but you know what it's like. To, you, you know what it feels like when it feels like all the wheels have fallen off. Things seem to be going good, and then they go from bad to worse, and and not, not only do you lose one wheel, you lose them all at the same time. Sometimes that's the way life is. These Thessalonians uh, had some wheels that, uh, that fell off. They had received the gospel. They believed that Jesus died and rose for their sins, and they put their trust in Him. And Paul, the, the one that preached that message first to them, was run out of town. And so, after he is run out of town, things get, go from, from bad to worse for them. They begin being treated uh, with contempt by, their, by those around them. They, uh, they, they uh, are, are told that Paul has, has forgotten about them or has ran out on them, that, that Paul was a coward. They, uh, they had begun to feel that God had forgotten about them. In fact, so much so, they had there was a rumor in the city that Jesus had, uh, had returned and had forgotten about them. So here they are going through an enormous amount of challenges and, and, and they have these problems. Life has gone from bad to worse. There is a rumor that the one that loved them the most has deserted them, that God has forgotten about them and rumors were going around that... Um, that they could not substantiate. Or they couldn't challenge, I guess is a better way to say it. In the midst of all that, Paul writes them a letter. And in this letter, he convinces them. He appeals to them, and he encourages them to stand strong and to remain standing despite opposition because what they thought was true, what they thought to be true, is really not true. Paul is going to try to convince them in this letter that he still loves them, that Jesus has not come yet, and when he comes, he will come for them, and that, uh, that despite everything that they're going through, they have the ability and the courage and the encouragement in order to be able to stand. And so when all the wheels fall off, Paul tells them to keep going. We're only going to look at a few a few verses this morning, but listen to, uh, listen to these verses as, as, as Paul convinces them that they can still keep standing when, um, when they face opposition. In chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, Paul says this. He says, but we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God shows you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this He called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. And then He prayed. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Father, would you be with us uh, this morning? Would you be with us as, uh, as we face the challenges of life and as many face the challenges of faith? Would you give us the ability and the encouragement to stand despite whatever we're going through? Father, we love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. 
Well, as we mentioned, Paul in these, in these few verses here reminds us of all we really need to know in order to overcome or to endure the opposition that you and I face in life and in faith. He grounds it in, in, in three things. He tries to give them encouragement in three areas. The first is, the first has to do with their identity. Paul reminds them that God has chosen them. Let, let me read you how he says it in, in verse 13. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because He chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Paul is saying here that you have confidence not because you've made this great choice to follow God. You ought to have confidence because before you made the choice to follow God, God made the choice to save you. He, he says it very clear uh, in, these, in these verses. He says, it, says, it says, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. There's uh, different ways that that, um, that that phrase first fruits is interpreted. Some, it, 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 in, in, the, in, the, in the Greek, it, uh, it, it reads something similar to, to SRK. Uh, basically, uh, in, uh, in the beginning or, or beforehand or before other things. First of all, some people would say that that refers to to the, the Thessalonians being chosen first, they're sort of the first fruits of other fruit that would come later. That God chose them in the beginning to be the first ones to be saved. Other people would say that it refers to God choosing them not in the beginning of those to be saved, but, but in the beginning, before they made a choice to follow God, God made the choice that they would follow Him. Now, however you translate that, however you interpret that, however you look at that, we, we notice this. That before the, that, that the confidence of these believers, that they have the confidence to know that their security with God was not because they chose God, but because beforehand He chose them. And that gives me great confidence. Do you know why? Because one thing I've noticed is, is throughout life, you and I make a whole lot of bad choices, don't we? <laughs> I was just thinking earlier today, it doesn't change with age, does it? I, I, I've sort of noticed if, if I get injured, it's for one of two reasons. When I was young, I got it. I, I, when I was young, I was foolish enough to think I was grown. Now that I'm grown, I'm foolish enough to think that I'm young. That, 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 isn't, isn't that how we make choices? When we're young, we make foolish choices because we think. We, we think our mind is more mature than it really is. And when we're older, we make foolish choices because we think our body is younger than it really is. Whatever it is, you and I go through life. Sometimes making, we, we may make some good choices, but you and I go through life making a series of bad choices. And you know what? According to this, these believers should have great comfort and encouragement because God chose them. The security of the relationship is in the choice of God, not in their choice. And that gives me, that gives me great comfort. Let, let, let me show you a little bit about the choice of God. Number one, it's based in love. It says here, we ought to always give thanks to you, brothers, beloved by the Lord. God... God loved them, and because He loved them, He chose them. The security is in the, in the choice of Christ, but it's also in the love of Christ. And, and then He describes it here. He says, brothers loved by God, He, he chose you as the first fruits uh, to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and the belief in truth. Let me, just, let, let me just explain what that word sanctification means. It basically means that God, that God, uh, as He, a a after He chose them, He changed them. That, uh, that, that their behavior began to change because God had chosen them and because they followed Christ. Now watch this. God did not choose them because they changed their behavior. Rather, they changed their behavior because God had chosen them. 
They, they, they didn't have, that, that, that sounds harsh, but here's the thing. They didn't have the ability to change their own behavior in their own power. They needed to do it, that they needed to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you and I want to change our behavior, but we don't have the power or the ability to do so. We need God to change it for us. Now, yes, there's some effort involved in our part, which we'll talk about in a second. But ultimately, it says here that they are sanctified, they are changed, they are set apart because of the work of Christ, the love of Christ, and the call of Christ. In the Old Testament, um, God says that he will give his people. He said, he said in, in Old Testament, the, the prophet says that, uh, that people have a heart of flesh, but God is going to take their, I'm sorry, their heart of, in, in Old Testament, Jeremiah says that uh, God's people have a heart of stone. But God is going to remove that heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And when he gives them a heart of flesh, when he gives them a new heart, they're able to respond in the right way. You, you and I can't follow God or, or please God until our heart has been changed. It's not that we please God and do good things and then God changes our heart. It, it is, that we, um, is that God changes our heart. And then once God changes our heart, after that, our behavior and our actions change. This week, I've had, I've had the same computer. I've had a MacBook Pro. I've had this computer for 11 years. And uh, the, 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 the computer hasn't quite given up the ghost yet, but uh, it, it's clearly on life support. And so uh, I, I, needed to order a new, I needed to order a new computer this week. But one of the challenges of ordering a new computer when you have an old computer is, is sometimes your old, the old computer doesn't have the ability to place the order for the new computer. You, you all have been in that position before, haven't you? you, you you've had a problem with your cell phone, and, and you've been told to call the cell phone company, but the reason you can't call the cell phone company is because your phone doesn't work. Or I remember I, my, our internet went out recently. And I call internet. How, how do I repair it? They said, well, go online and fill out, a, fill out an order ticket. I said, I can't go on and fill out an order ticket because my internet's down. <laughs> That's kind of how it is sometimes with God. That our heart can't change our behavior. Our behavior can't change our heart. That's a better way to say it. Our behavior cannot change our heart. We cannot be changed until God gives us a new heart. And through the death and resurrection of Jesus and, and the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, the changing of the Holy Spirit, God gives His people a new heart. And once he gives us a new heart, then we have the ability to change our behavior. Paul is uh, writing to these, these believers in Thessalonica, and they're uh, up against opposition. They don't know how they're going to endure. And Paul tells them that they're loved by God, they're chosen by God, and they're changed by God. And so therefore, their identity rests in who God is and what he's done for them. And that gives them great encouragement. Well, not only, not, not only do they, um, not, not only can they face opposition because of, uh, of their identity, they can also face opposition with some effort of their own. Now watch this. The, the, the effort is not what, uh, the effort is not what saves them. The effort uh, comes because they've been saved. Notice how he words it. Uh, how he words it here, beginning of verse fifty, he says, "So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letters." He, he tells him, he says, "Stand firm in the traditions that you have been taught." Standing firm is not what gives them the ability to endure. The fact that they have their identity is what gives them the ability to stand firm. That they don't stand firm in order to win. 
They don't stand firm in order to get the victory. They stand firm because God has already given them the victory and because God has already established them. That gives them the ability to stand firm. They they can stand firm because they know they've been chosen by God and there is no way that they can lose. You and I stand firm not in order to get the love of Christ. We stand firm because we have the love of Christ. You, you, you and I stand firm not because not in order to get the favor of God, but because we have the favor of God. You and I stand firm not in order to get God to love us. You and I can stand firm because we know that God loves us. In fact, knowing our identity in Christ does not cause us to sit down or to lie down, but it causes us to rise up and to, and to stand firm. To stand firm in the tradition. Paul is likening, or he's not liking them. He's calling them to go back and remember what they have been taught. Some of it's through the spoken word of Paul. Some of it is through the letters of Paul. Some of it is through the, the, the history of Israel that we see in the Old Testament. And Paul reminds them that it is possible that if we're not, or, or, or I would say, it, Paul, Paul says here to stand firm and to hold the traditions because if not, they're going to forget how they got to where they are. One of my mentors, Dr. Jeffrey Authors, says that people need to be reminded as much as they need to be taught. I, 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 think, that's, I think that's true throughout life. The younger, you or I, the younger you and I are, the, the more we need to be taught things. But the older we are, the more we need to be reminded of things. Israel, when God had called His people out of, uh, out of slavery, out of Egypt. Many of you know the story. Israel is in, 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 in Egypt and, they're, and they're, they're, they're in slavery. They're, they're, forced to, uh, they're, they're forced to do labor. Moses goes to Pharaoh and Moses says to him, let, let my people go. And Pharaoh refuses to do so and actually increases the work. Then, um, in addition to that, Moses goes to Pharaoh again. Pharaoh still refuses to let them go. God sends a whole bunch of plagues eventually to the point that God's people are, are, are led out of Egypt by Pharaoh. But uh, the problem is, when they get out into the wilderness, they begin to forget where they came from. In fact, in Exodus chapter 10, the people in the wilderness begin to murmur. And they say to Moses, Moses, um, were there no graves in Egypt that you had to bring us out here in the wilderness to die? They, they, they actually, uh, they, they worded it another way. They, um, they, they basically said to Moses, um, uh, they basically said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away? What have you done in bringing us out here? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? They're saying to Moses out in the wilderness, Moses, We told you when we were in Egypt that we wanted to stay there and we wanted to stay in bondage. Now, you and I both know that's not true. But the problem is sometimes when you and I walk through the wilderness of life, we can forget what God has brought us from. The the Israelites had forgotten that God brought them out of bondage, that He had brought them out of oppression, that He had brought them out of slavery. They had forgotten that because they were going through a season of life that was difficult. In fact, there's another passage where they talk about how they used to sit around with pots full of meat and had everything they wanted. That's not how it was. But the problem is when you and I go through challenges of life, when we go through times of, that are difficult, when we go through seasons that are demanding, we can look back at a difficult and a bitter past and we can look back at it in a way that it did not exist. 
we can look back and say, wait a minute, life was a whole lot easier before I started following Jesus. We can look back and say, life was a whole lot easier when I was in that situation instead of this situation. We can look back and maybe an addiction cycle, maybe a, a terrible relationship cycle, maybe just a maybe just a, a period of life that you were just making some really poor and immature decisions. Sometimes it's, it's easy to look back at that era and period of life with fondness and remember it in a way that it did not exist. It's difficult to do that, especially if we're honest when we look at, when we look at timelines and tweets in the news. We're constantly being fed something that um, at best is edited. And we feel that we're missing out on, on this life. And that maybe life would be better if we lived it in an era that is long ago. That's what happens when you and I get spiritual amnesia, when we forget what God has done for us when we forget the truth of the Scriptures, when we forget the traditions, when we forget that God brought Israel out of bondage and how, 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 how the same God that brought Israel out of Egypt is the same God that, brings you, that has brought you and I out of our own sin and the eternal consequences of that sin. We forget those things because we, we forget we forget to remember. It's interesting, in, in Scripture, we see the word remember repeated. God says over and over again throughout Scripture, remember, remember, remember. Because you and I have a tendency to forget things. Especially when they say, you know, we've been talking about this, that the average person spends two hours and 46 minutes a day on, uh, on the Internet or on social media. We're so focused on what's happening today that we forget what God has done in the past and what God will do in the future. So in order to stand firm, we need to hold to the teachings and to the traditions of the Scriptures that have given hope and encouragement to people in every generation those same things that will give us encouragement in this generation. So, so, so number one, we, we rest in our identity, the fact that God has chosen us. Secondly, we rest, um, we, we don't rest, but we stand firm in our effort. That is, we stand firm by holding to the traditions. And the final thing that uh, gives us great encouragement really is the, the word encouragement itself. We rest in the encouragement and the comfort that comes from God alone. L listen, listen to how he... Uh, how, how Paul words it in his prayer. He says, Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the God of our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, may he comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work. There's a couple things he says that he's going to do in here, but, but one is he reminds us of the love of God. He says, The God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort. What you and I, what, what, what sustains and keeps you and I is the love and the character of God. It's, it's, um, it's not the first time that it's mentioned in the Scriptures. How God loves His people. And because He loves His people, and because His love is not a love that fades, it's not a love that changes, it's not a love that's insufficient. The love of God is eternal. And because God loves us eternally, because God will never love you any more or any less than He loves you right now, because there's nothing you can do to earn the love of God or to lose the love of God, because there's nothing you can do to, to cause God's love for you to increase or decrease, that, that gives us the great encouragement that the love of God will sustain us. More than that, the power of God will sustain us. The strength of God will sustain us. When, when I was growing up, my, one of my favorite athletes of all time was Carl Lewis. Love, 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 loved Carl Lewis. 
top sprinter, uh, one of the top sprinters in the United States in, in 1980, the year of the, um, in, in the year of the, the, the Olympic boycott. Won four gold medals in, in 1984. In 1988, I was expecting him to win another four gold medals. Um, but he had a problem. And the problem is, in the 100-meter dash, he lost to a Canadian named Ben Johnson. Well, even though Lewis finished second in the race, he was awarded the gold medal. And the reason he was awarded the gold medal is it was determined, it was found out, that Ben Johnson had cheated in the race, that Ben Johnson was using steroids that gave him an advantage. These steroids gave him an advantage over all the rest of the athletes. Now, if you've been around long enough, you know what steroids can do, or you've seen what steroids can do. What they do is... um, they strengthen someone, they, they give someone a supernatural, not a supernatural, an unnatural advantage over the competitors. It's something outside themselves that once they take, it gives them a, a, a level of strength or a level of endurance that they previously did not have. And so you see it in the life of of Ben Johnson, how he can run faster and he's stronger because he takes these steroids. Or you see it in the life of Lance Armstrong that can endure, that can endure longer than others because he has something, some advantage that the other athletes don't have that, give him, that gives him the ability to endure what they cannot endure. It's a steroid. This word here, when it says that God may comfort your hearts and establish them, that word, that word in the Greek, it's stera. It's where we get the word steroid from. What he's saying here is that God, um, I want to be clear, he's not saying that God gives you illegal drugs to cause you <laughs> to run faster, jump higher, or lift more than other people. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this is that when God establishes us, what He does give us is He gives us the ability to endure and to stand and to be strengthened in a way that is not natural for an individual. In other words, you can stand when others would fall. You, 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 can, give up, you, you can get up whenever, when others would fall. Would, would give up. You can endure things that others don't have the ability to endure because there is an advantage that you have that not everyone else has and that advantage, steroid, that advantage is established by God Himself. So when you're like, Jason, I don't have the ability to face this opposition on my own. You're right, you don't. But God can establish you. Say, Jason, I don't have the ability to continue to endure. I'm, I, 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 I'm worn out. I'm weary. I don't think I can go on. You know what? God has the ability to establish you. We, we, we used to say something on the outside that's working on the inside that brings a mighty change in my life. In life, you're going to face much opposition. If you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to face much opposition. The difference is, do you want to face opposition in life with Jesus or without Jesus? And those that that walk with Jesus, we, we have great confidence and we have the ability to overcome opposition. We have the ability to overcome discouragement. We have the ability to overcome the challenges of life. Because number one, our identity rests in Christ. He chose us. Our our, our efforts are based on on the traditions and what has been taught to us in Scripture. And finally, because God gives us a love and encouragement that we do not earn on our own, but God makes available 
for his people today. Lord, sometimes it seems like the wheels fall off in life. And sometimes it can be tempting, like the Thessalonians, to think that you have forgotten about us. But Lord, I believe, I believe that you still enable your people to overcome opposition. I believe you do so by reminding us that we've been called and chosen by you. Not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of who you are and what you do. I believe, Lord, that um, that causes us to stand firm. We don't stand firm in order to be chosen. We stand firm because we have been chosen. And Lord, I believe that based on your love, that you give us a comfort and an encouragement that is not available to all people, but you give to your children. Father, would you remind us that we belong to you? Would you remind us of the truth of, of the Scriptures? Would you give us the comfort and the um, endurance that only you can give? Father, we love you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, I want to thank you uh, once again for being with us uh, today with our, at our Hope Online service. Um, I'm so glad that you're part of the Hope family. I know some of us are worshiping uh, in camp, on campus this morning. I know some of us are watching online. Uh, I'm just so glad that you've chosen to be with us and to, uh, and, and to worship the Lord with us. I do want to make you aware of a couple things. Um, you can find us at www.hopeindayton.org. Uh, while you're there, you can give of your tithes and your gifts and your offerings. You can also do that through our Push Pay app or through our text to give, or of course you can mail your cash and check here to our uh, Wilmington Pike uh, location. I uh, also want to let you know, uh, you should have a connection card, I believe, uh, I believe underneath the screen, if you, you have a connection card, we encourage you to fill that out. Uh, and we also encourage you to, su to subscribe, hit the subscribe link, and if you do that, you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to stay more connected to us. Uh, check this out. If you reach out to us, if you, uh, for the first time, you fill out a connection card, you let us know who you are, you let us know how we can serve you, J just let us know who you are. Um, we, we would love to send you a gift, all right? Uh, but we don't, know, we don't know who to send it to or where to send it to. So if, uh, if you're watching this today, um, let us know who you are by filling out the connection card um, or by, by emailing us and letting us know. If you, this is your first time, we'd love to send you uh, a gift. Uh, from us. Promise you nobody's not going to knock on your door, uh, but we just want to send you, I uh, just want to send you something. Uh, also, I was mentioning about giving a moment ago. During this month, we're doing a scholarship drive, and uh, one of the things I'm so thankful for the last several years, and even this year, is Hope has, uh, has helped put people through college, and uh, we, want to, uh, we want to encourage our college students, uh, both our students just coming out of high school, and some people uh, uh, going to college later in life, we want to make these scholarships available. And uh, whatever you give to our scholarship fund uh, will go, 100% will go directly to our students. And so uh, when you mail in your cash or check, you can designate uh, a portion of that. Uh, just let us know what portion of that you want designated to the scholarship fund. And if you use our Push Pay app or you give online, uh, there should be a line item there that will say scholarship or scholarship fund. And uh, we encourage you to do that. So. We hope, that, uh, we hope that your April is, uh, is ending well. It's so, we're so thankful. Uh, Turn the corner. This, earlier this week, we had, uh, we had snow. So um, hopefully that's, uh, that's behind us for the rest of the spring. But uh, we'd love to see you. Please let us know how you're doing. You can find us online, as we said, at hopeanddayton.org. Uh, or if you feel comfortable and, and, uh, and your doctor's ready for you to be out, we'd love to see you uh, part of our, our uh, Wilmington Pike family. Have a great week. Lord bless. Stay standing, and we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you. Lord bless. Bye. There's a table that you prepare.
is how 